spend a lot of time together, years and years, actually talking about new contracts, social contracts, uh, uh, that is dealing with economy, with climate change, with the global governance. So we think that it is important, that we conclude that it is very important to fight pandemic, having in mind that this pandemic is not the last one that is going to hit us in our lifetime, regardless how long do we live. Uh, and it's having said so, we also consider that it is very important to make correlation between pandemic and climate change, because these two things are very much interrelated. And in that context, uh, we think that we should give another push to Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals, not in the sense of redefining them, but trying to find a way how we can create bigger global consensus and what to do along the climate change, uh, uh, along, along the climate change issue. Uh, we also uh, concluded that we are, maybe there is big uh, fear that after pandemic, we can witness some kind of new global major players, uh, not only USA and China, which it looks inevitable if something doesn't happen seriously, but also to have a triangle with Russia in that context. And that is another reason why we should go for some kind of new multilateralism models and to see how we can include not only G20, but also uh, include uh, countries that are called uh, non-alignment movement countries, in which especially to use the privilege or use the, the fact that right now Azerbaijan with President Aliyev is basically chairing non-alignment movement and see how that can be reunited and give additional push to the uh, agenda that we're talking about. In that sense, we also uh, saw and uh, I mean uh, importance uh, of the reform of multilateral organizations, especially financial institutions, having in mind that the countries will have their own economic strategies, but at the same time we need strong international push by international financial institutions, uh, starting from the fact that today about, as, uh, as, um, as Helen mentioned, according to ILO, there is about half of population, working population, now out of job because of shutdown, not mentioning the jobs that were, in a, that were irreversibly lost. So uh, to, to, con to conclude with, uh, we think that uh, it is important to right now to start talking about how the new normal will look like in sense of uh, not only uh, epidemics, but having in mind tsunamis and flattening the curve of epidemics that we want to flatten down, the curve of education uh, problems in the educational system, having in mind that there's, there are literally hundreds of millions of kids are, that are home because they have no technology access to it. And economic, flattening economic crisis curve is the third curve that should be somehow uh, seen in consideration how to flatten. And finally, the fourth one is environmental or climate change curve that is now withdrawing a little bit because of the shutdown of our economy, but it may erupt again. And in that context, we identified three, three stages, so to speak. One is re, uh, resilience to actually confront what is happening right now. Another one is return or rebuild the things that should be rebuilt. But again, saying the third most important thing is in principle is re, you, reinventing or reimagination or reinventing the new normal because as we said, economy, social uh, structures, Global governance structures in the nation state have to be reimagined in new normal time. Of course, uh, this is just a small excerpt. It's my yes, own. yes, I understand. So I, thank you I, very I, much. I know that there are a lot of things that I'm repeating that you already plan to say, but I just want to do short wrap up of what we conclude is as a mainstream point. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, but uh, let me challenge because there is a a, a very optimistic. Uh, uh, thread through some of that, and I'm happy to welcome Jeff Sachs, who just uh, joined us. And in fact, I will uh, ask that question to Jeff because he actually published a paper uh, or, or an op-ed uh, piece on that. Uh, because what we are witnessing, in fact, is that countries have handled this situation extremely differently, and the results have been dramatic. And I really mean the word dramatic. Uh, the difference between the countries of East Asia and the Western countries in how uh, they have handled this uh, 
challenge has been remarkable. Uh, and with a result that this is really the first time that for many people around the globe, uh, that uh, the US uh, and uh, to a certain extent Europe uh, are not the natural leaders that people look to. And uh, there has been also a greater attractiveness for a number of people for authoritarian regimes. Jeff, can you just tell us quickly, because you summarized it so powerfully in that op-ed, what's the difference between what happened in East Asia and what happened in the West? Yeah, first, uh, great to be with everybody and see uh, so many friends. Uh, so I'm really, uh, really pleased that we're getting together. Roshan, thank you for bringing us together, and Ismail for bringing us together. Uh, in an epidemic, uh, of course, the, the name of the game is the effective reproduction number. Uh, that is how many people each infected person infects on, on average. If it's greater than one, you have an epidemic. If it's less than one, the epidemic is controlled. Uh, we can control an epidemic by locking down everyone in their rooms. Then they can't infect anyone except who else is in their room. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is what part of the world is doing right now. That brings the effective reproduction number under one. The other way to bring the effective reproduction number under one, the much better way, is that you uh, put in isolation only those who are infected uh, and the rest go about their business. That is a targeted public health approach. Of course, uh, the challenge is being able to accomplish that. Essentially, what the East Asian countries have done is they have been able to isolate infected individuals much earlier, much more decisively, and so have been able to do less of the general lockdown and more of the very targeted lockdown. And they've done many smart things. First, they did the basics of public health, which is that you uh, test, you uh, contact, you trace the contacts, and you quarantine or isolate those who are infected or likely to be infected. Quarantine means in a public facility as opposed to home. In the United States and Europe, so much is stay home, but then you infect everyone else at home uh, or in your nursing home or your long-term care center or your prison. We're like idiots not even thinking uh, what we're telling people to do because we're having mass deaths in congregant settings. Second, all through Asia, they applied good, rapid applications for notification, for services, for uh, contact tracing, uh, for health at the workplace. For, and we haven't done that. Uh, so if you look, and today there's a story about how, how Samsung has kept its supply chains open, taking the temperature of every worker, protecting the workforce. We're not doing these things. We can't keep our meat packing uh, uh, plants open in the United States because we don't do the first bit of serious public health. So the bottom line, Ismail, is that there are two ways to keep our, the effective reproduction number less than one. You can lock up the economy. Uh, and a shelter at home. Even that doesn't work uh, entirely because people go out and they mingle and they don't obey. Or you can have public health that is intensive, and that is uh, testing, tracing, isolating, quarantining, and safe workplace practices. That's the East Asian experience. It is not the Western European and the United States experience. And the results are, are stunning in terms of the number of uh, deaths per million population, for example. It, it's about a factor of 100 to 1. And as I have pointed out and been agonized over this for weeks, uh, one part of the world, about 1.8 billion people, has this under control. It's a completely different world for East Asia. If I say anything positive about China and the United States, I'm considered a communist and a traitor. So <laughs> the, the inability to learn 
from anything in the United States has become almost complete. Uh, if you cite a foreign something, you're a suspect uh, intellectual who ought to be removed from uh, their position uh, because we've become a, an idiocracy, as a, a good movie 15 years ago put it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if we look at what East Asia is doing, many countries have the chance still to do this because they had much fewer cases coming in. So the epidemic is still low. And but then the learn idea from, is learn from them, yes. intensive public health uh, along the checklist and it stays low. And then the idea is we piece together, they call it the bubble, but you put more and more countries that are effectively keeping the epidemic at bay together and you start reestablishing some normalcy even across national borders. And uh, Western Europe and the United States by and large failed miserably. The main countries all failed. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, you know, the Wall Street Journal every day writes an editorial praising Germany because it's a tiny bit better than France and Italy, but they never write about East Asia. Uh, they don't tell the readers anything about what's happening halfway around the world. It's just an incredible thing. And okay. um, my, my final point is, Mel, just I want people to understand and, and know, I'm sure that they do. It is now, uh, and it's circulated, I could share it with you if you haven't seen it, a 57-page memo of the Republican Party, how to attack China in the epidemic. This is the idea of politics is uh, deflect any responsibility by blaming China and creating the conditions for Cold War. And this is the literal, explicit campaign idea for Trump. And have no doubt, he's at least 50% chance to win. Uh, and uh, th this is the if it is, it's the end of U.S. democracy, I'm afraid. Uh, well, uh, we're, we're that close. I'm, I'm glad you raised that point at the end, because I think many of the people uh, who have been commenting on what happened in East Asia have also been saying, well, that's because they have totalitarian regimes. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, maybe this will be seen later on, 2020 is when the rise of East Asia in a new global order began to be uh, recognized and also where the attractiveness of authoritarian regimes uh, uh, to many people even in the European countries and elsewhere uh, began to be uh, seen more clearly. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, welcome Kerry Kennedy who joined us, but I would like to turn to President Vaira Vicky Freiberg and ask her uh, President Vaira, do you think that the better performance of some of the more authoritarian countries will give a chance for leaders in democratic countries to uh, pull together the strings of power and assert more authoritarianism, more populism, more whatever one likes, or will uh, democracy uh, continue to prevail uh, uh, at least in those parts of the world where it exists? <laughs> it should do so because uh... Um, uh, I think it would be a tragedy in addition to all the, the lives we have lost during this pandemic uh, if, it were, if we were also to, to bury uh, democracy and democratic principles uh, along uh, with, uh, with those dying from the virus. Um, may I first of all uh, express my deep appreciation to Jeffrey Sachs for being with us, but uh, particularly for being with us every day. Uh, of the week, practically. Uh, Jeffrey, you have been an uh, inexhaustible fount of, of information and statistics and, and objective analysis. And granted that you, you do it from clearly, uh, uh, if you like, partisan positions, uh, I must say that as somebody not at all involved in, in uh, American politics, I, I, I couldn't help but be express something that's now going around the Latvian um, the Latvian press uh, to the extent that uh, the current American president is, is something of a catastrophe. Uh, although usually uh, somebody in my position would refrain uh, from, uh, from saying so because of course uh, he was elected by the American people and it's, it's up to the American people like you 
um, to express their dissatisfaction with him. But that's frankly where all of us are involved. His decisions, for instance, regarding the World uh, Health Organization uh, affect the world, the entire world. Uh, his attitude towards it uh, presents uh, a precedent uh, which others would be only too glad to follow. Uh, a negative precedent, uh, which really we do not need. Uh, in terms of the authoritarianism being responsible for the success uh, in Eastern Asia, I would, I would like to think that it's rather the conception uh, of uh, public health, as Jeffrey just explained to us, the elements uh, within a public health rational response to a pandemic, uh, that they had in place because of their earlier experience with the related virus, which was SARS, uh, and, uh, and in fact the, the severe uh, losses uh, and problems that it caused them at the time. Uh, they having really felt uh, intimately uh, the uh, negative results of ill preparedness uh, had already taken public health measures and to my understanding they have nothing to do with either democracy or, uh, or totalitarianism. It, it was not uh, the leader of North Korea who, who invented these measures. It was uh, the public health officials and the scientists together with sensible politicians granted uh, who, who adopted them. And uh, the, uh, the measures to be taken uh, and how they're applied uh, vary within uh, Europe itself. Uh, we are shocked at how uh, the oldest uh, and, and richest, uh, or at least some of the richest countries in Europe have, uh, have been so ill prepared to deal with the situation um, and how others, uh, uh, I should be careful to uh, not to, as, as uh, in Morocco they used to say, you, you mustn't um, praise something that you care for or the jinns will hear you and, uh, and then <laughs> jump on you. Uh, so far we have had 19 deaths in Latvia uh, and, and I hope the jinns are not listening, the jinnun are, are asleep <laughs> and, and we will keep, uh, keep those figures low. Um, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> I was speaking uh, last fall uh, to the Paris Senate uh, it was the occasion was uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but the question was about European security. And I told at the time to the audience uh, in the French Senate that Europe needs coordinated mechanisms of interaction uh, in time of crisis uh, so that they can manage to deal with a crisis and a health crisis. And I said everything from the consequences of uh, global warming to a pandemic should be included into security concerns of uh, the European Union nations, not just military security, which Savada Swaid goes without saying, it is part of it, but that security includes uh, people's uh, right to life uh, and health, uh, and that uh, coordinating measures should be taken. But then it turned out that when France was in severe need of masks, uh, as, as something as simple as that, which it happens, we are, have small manufacturers in Latvia manufacturing masks. We have more masks than, than we need. We can export them. Sweden was sending equipment, health equipment, to Spain when the, the pandemic took uh, really took on there. And what happened? France blocked it. France blocked the trucks, would not let them through because it had locked down its borders, its internal borders. And uh, at the highest level of government, interventions had to be made and par, uh, pour, pour parler, you know, the debates between the French and, and the Swedish governments in order to get those trucks of assistance from Sweden, through Germany, through France, through down to Spain, which is appalling. This is the sort of thing that has nothing to do with democracy or totalitarianism. It has to do with common sense and the ability to distinguish between restricting movement of people and monitoring movement of people from focuses, uh, foci of infection to the general population and actual movement of uh, absolutely necessary goods, which will include, by the way, food and other medicines 
other diseases have not stopped while COVID is raging in the world. People do need care now. We cannot just simply have all hospitals locked down and waiting for COVID patients uh, when people are dying of cancer and other diseases. So that I think I, I wish people wouldn't drag democracy and autocracy into it. I, I do believe the, the problem well, is elsewhere. Yes, I mean, uh, one would wish, but <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes they do. Uh, if I may turn to Matt Carlson, and I want to ask uh, two questions that are really the following up on, on uh, President Vira's uh, observations. The first is that uh, if we think of the world order, not just the European order, but the world order, uh, it seems that Europe took a good initiative, for example, in trying for the vaccine fund. Uh, but what is, uh, is surprising that $8 billion that were raised is, is great, but both, uh, well, United States, China, and Russia uh, did not participate. Uh, China sent uh, the local ambassador to, to the EU. They just sat in and listened, but didn't participate, but neither did Russia, neither did uh, uh, the United States. Uh, so uh, question number one, is uh, what does that tell us about establishing a, a, a global collaboration uh, and a, glo a new world order uh, where Europe will play a, a major role, but so should the United States, so should China, so should Russia, etc. So that's question one. And then question two, do you believe that the current uh, uh, international organizations, starting with WHO or FAO for food, are uh, capable in terms of uh, the limited uh, uh, mandates and authorities that uh, the member states will give them to lead this effort at coordinating global action against a global enemy. Thank you, Tanaina. Thank you. Thanks all for coming together to discuss these extremely challenging subjects. Let me answer those two questions as best I can. First, regarding the European Union. I'm glad that there is still some agency in the European Union to act internationally when it has its own problems, even keeping the solidarity alive within its institution. We've seen how north and south of Europe, even a bit of the east and west, uh, differences coming back in and impacting the European Union. So it's good that it acts. It's very bad that uh, US and China and Russia did not participate in such a common sense initiative that uh, Vida spoke about that was the one on vaccines. This is an example of what has to be overcome. But we are going in a wrong direction everywhere. And I would really put the emphasis on, uh, on how the international system is stressed and neglected and how dangerous that is. Uh, regarding the international institutions and their strengths, I wish that we even maintain what they used to be. What we are seeing is a deterioration of the support of these institutions at a moment when, when they were weakening, but when we need them uh, even more. So the situation is even more dire and we are not moving in a direction of sustainability in international cooperation. And when institutions of power like the G20 or indeed EU or G7 are not uh, meeting and providing any strong leadership in what we are facing, we should really be worried. And therefore, I, I would like Ismail and colleagues to really stress that we, at the same time that we are facing the coronavirus strike, uh, crisis, Think about the future. You yourself made that point initially, Ismail, and so did Slatko. But really to think even further ahead. And it's not just uh, trying to be wishful thinking about any new world order that will come, but it is in how we handle this crisis that we actually create uh, the future. It's like when people speak about health and economic recovery as two competing things, where in fact they are interlinked and so the future and today have to be addressed at the same time just like health and economics. Uh, the um, articles and commentary are now full of predictions of what the world will be like. Some say it will be more or less the same when the crisis goes, which was not good. Some say we'll have a seismic shift to something that is even worse. And some of us are trying to see opportunity 
in the crisis. Uh, opportunity, for example, in seeing state and public health in the public institutions even strengthened after a period when they were weakened. We also see perhaps a resurgence in understanding the importance of science and facts, which was on, the, on going down in the past years in my reading of the world, like Jeff said. And then thirdly, also that we perhaps can see the importance of addressing inequality or divisions within society, which are the, at the core of the very problem, why we are, why we are finding it so difficult to address the situation. Okay. Thank, thank now, you, Max. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you for, for a question on Sweden particularly. Uh, but uh, I'd like to turn to Anna, uh, Anna Palacio, who uh, may want to comment on not only the European situation, but also the global, uh, evolving the global order as it stands now. Uh, could, could I suggest uh, everybody mute uh, their microphones when they're not speaking, because we're hearing more and more uh, echo. Uh, so if you can mute uh, while you're not speaking, I think we'll all hear more clearly. Okay. That's a good I just unmuted myself, is my thank you. And thank you uh, for the organizing all this, all of you, Vera, uh, you in the first place. I mean, look, uh, we know that what we are seeing right now is that this hecatomb has acted as a catalyzer of processes that were going on and as a revelator of cracks that were there. I'm sure that there are other processes that we don't see yet and that will become more and more visible. But for the moment, what we see is this, uh, this, this, uh, this process, old processes that have been in haste and many of them, unfortunately, are just, I mean, uh, uh, accelerated. Allow me to speak about two. One is the difficulties within the European Union. Um, we have had a, a, a breakdown of the internal market, and we are not yet back into having a normal functioning of the internal market. And in the, 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 the constitutional German court that delegitimizes the uh, Luxembourg so the, the jurisdictional system of the European Union. So we were before, before the crisis, we were in an intergovernmental moment, a very difficult moment where we had to be imaginative. We had to be uh, ingenious in how to navigate these waters. And now we are there. And yes, there have been, uh, Vera has mentioned that, there have been uh, symbolic moves like bringing 10 or 20 uh, sick people from Italy to Germany. But the truth of the matter is that still today, we don't have our internal market. Without the internal market, we have big difficulties. This is my first comment. The second comment is in another trend that was ongoing, the, the transatlantic difficulties. Vera, you are absolutely right. A, we cannot confine our institutional relationship to NATO. Until now, during the Cold War, it makes sense. Our transatlantic institutional relationship was NATO, was security. And NATO, I must say, that has, ha has made a big effort to expand, to reinvent itself. But OK, NATO is NATO. NATO is mainly about armies, about defense. And we have to address the new threats, the new challenges, and among them, this one. Um, I think that in this transatlantic relationship, we need to address China. Um, no, I, I mean, if we had more time, I think we, of course, we cannot blame China in, an, in a 180 degrees thing, but uh, there are issues. Why were we Spain, France, Italy, but also Great Britain so late in reacting? Because frankly, there was no, we had no experience, Vaira, this is fundamental, and we didn't, we didn't uh, understand the threat that we had, we had ahead of us, and honestly, we didn't understand it because whatever we say now, the WHO did not send the pertinent signals at the right time. This is something that we have to agree. And yes, we have 
mismanage. We, meaning Spain in the first place, but as I say, France and Italy and Great Britain. So it's not just a matter of South and kissing and touching, which of course it is as well. It's cultural. We kiss, we are much closer. My, my, yeah, well, you know, these things matter. I mean, I'm sorry, we cannot become cold northerners uh, from one day to the next. My, my, last, my last comment, I conclude by this. I think that today we are celebrating the end of the war in the, in the European theater. And the end of the war is the triumph of law, of institutions on brute force, on, on just a power, power competition. And I think that we Europeans, we need to take this banner in multilateralism. But frankly, we, we, we don't make critical mass. We need, even today, Jeffrey, I fully agree and I read you with interest. But you know what? The truth of the matter is that we, we don't make critical mass with other United States. We want it or not, and many in Europe don't want it, but the United States is still the indispensable nation to... Ah, well, okay, we can discuss. We can discuss. I leave it there. We're going to have a discussion about the United States in a moment, and Kerry will join us along with Jeff uh, on that. But before we leave the, the global scene, I'd like to hear from uh, Eka uh, and from uh, Boris. Uh, Eka, would you like to say a few words? Of course, uh, I, I'm just unmuted myself as well. So excellent to see you all. And then it's been a while that we had a chance to have this conversation. So hopefully it's not new normal that only through the electronic ways we could have conversations, but for now it's already good enough. It's been a while. A uh, few, few issues that I wanted to pick up perhaps from uh, the conversation uh, that uh, was fascinating uh, to, to be part of. Um, one on authoritarian regimes. Um, I would uh, really uh, take it with great caution, uh, this perception as if there is indeed some level of attractiveness that is rising with the way how some, as they might be called, authoritarian regimes have dealt with the situation of crisis. First of all, I think it is a very um, uh, wrong definition to call uh, countries predominantly in, in, in Asia as authoritarian. They are not. And then we've seen that some countries like South Korea, for example, has shown a remarkable um, uh, way of delivering on this challenge and dealing with this challenge and by, by all means one cannot call South Korea an authoritarian regime but rather a democracy. Uh, and let's take an example of Russia which is one of the worst examples of how one can deal with this situation like COVID-19 uh, when information is uh, uh, not delivered to the population, which is one of the key elements of having an awareness uh, constantly at high level for the public to know what to do, how to do, and then to, to be in line with the regulations that could be prudently imposed by the state. It has been extremely late in imposing any measures of dealing with the pandemic. And we see that leadership of the country like Belarus is still even denying the concept that there is a pandemic per se. So if one would have a collective understanding of countries that are indeed authoritarian countries on how they are dealing with the situation of pandemic, with the sense of responsibility towards their own citizens, and I don't even touch here the responsibility they might uh, have been uh, showcasing with that towards their neighbors and globally, and then the issue of Russia not even participating in the pledge uh, initiative on development of the vaccine is a good example of that we see that they are nowhere there. If we speak about not health-related, a block of the issues, but then fiscal and monetary-related issues, how much countries could be of help to their own citizens in terms of recovering of the economy, but being the global players, we see even less from the countries that could be deemed authoritarian in this regard. They might be soon at the end of the recipient side of assistance that might be needed rather than the ones that could be contributing generously so for the common effort that could be needed. Uh, two uh, directions I would say that uh, are clear in which every country globally now has to deal with the situation and has local uh, layer of an impact and then a, a global one as well. Health related, economic and then social economic 
which has all of it uh, together. And then there is so much interrelated, as it has been mentioned already, that uh, one cannot definitely have any clear separation lines. But you see that at the political level, at the level of decision makers, uh, especially for the countries which don't have fiscal and monetary uh, elements at abundance, so to say, to be very mild on that. And we are the real uh, economy is still limited when it comes to how much these countries are part of the demand and supply chains uh, globally of the economic relationships. They really have to make tough choices on how to compromise or not on health-related issues when the economic side of a, an impact of the fallout uh, of the pandemic is become because becoming unbearable for them in a very short time period of time, I would imagine. So countries in the Eastern Europe, this is a big uh, challenge. How to ensure that the measures that have been in many countries, by the way, quite prudently introduced for, uh, for restricting the spread of the pandemic. And in this case, uh, my own country, Georgia, is a very good example. And then I would say that Ukraine, uh, where I live now, is a good example of that as well, with some delays, but still when it comes to the measures like that. But economic element of the fallout is becoming more and more uh, palpable and then soon can be unbearable for many. So in this regard, how much latitude the countries will have to have a balance between uh, economic and health-related challenges then come out from this very difficult situation would largely depend on whether or not there will be global cooperation based on the principle of solidarity, prudent planning, and then vision for the midterm and long term of coming out of this crisis. And then we've seen that when it comes to the uh, health related issues, it's not only containment or control of the spread of pandemic, but then thinking through what are the ways and mechanisms and instruments and tools that are related to diagnostics, therapeutics, and then vaccines that need to be developed in the way that they can be regarded more as a global commodity or the global, global public good. Yeah. Global, public global, good. global public good. Not the, the range of the terminology in the lawyer's mindset, as you can see, but something that, that is accessible uh, to to globally to those without the distinction of the inequalities that otherwise already were pervasive in the world uh, and how much global cooperation among the actors who have technological means, uh, fiscal means for that and ways of cooperation could come together so that it becomes a global good rather than something that becomes a way of chasing the economic profit in the future or just chasing the way of safeguarding the population first of your own and then to see how globally one could have access to that. And I would see that the European Union uh, and the Commission in that regard really showcased a, a strong leadership in this direction. And then the Global Pledge is the only initiative of that magnitude that actually brings the hope that one could look into this uh, direction where if, and I hope that it will be soon rather than later, there will be therapeutic and vaccines related uh, breakthroughs uh, at the global level, as well as better ways of diagnostics, I would imagine, uh, then it will not become again, an element of increasing uh, and deepening the inequalities in the world rather than something that could bring the common solution to it. And then second block that worries me a lot, obviously, it related with the economic component of it. And then I still don't have a final uh, view of myself, to myself, uh, whether or not the international uh, organizations, IFIs, in that regard on a global stage or even, even uh, regional uh, instruments that I have placed could be fit for that because uh, the, the level of indebtedness of many countries in the developing world was already very high. So what is the way for them to come out from this situation as they will find themselves already very soon without a clarity of, of, of uh, instruments that could deliver quickly, uh, which are different from what the structural reforms related standby arrangements from IMF we are for many countries, for example. What will be the ways of approaching the debts we'll, to either by, by we'll sovereign nations the or economics. by private institutions? We'll get into it's, the economics it's, it's, in a moment, yeah. But this is, this is, these are the two big blocks and very final... I'm sorry. And then 
small businesses and public. And then I think it is very important to mention, I said in very one, in one sentence, basically. What I see, especially in Ukraine, private businesses, small and medium businesses and public has mobilized enormously to help the government, which has more limited resources in this regard, perhaps, to deal with the situation. So generating and fundraising, uh, fundraising the capacities monetarily or otherwise by the society and by the private businesses, which are not the large businesses even, but small and medium in these difficult times, have been incredible to see in the country which faces the, the challenge of a war and then the challenge of pandemic. And then in some ways one can see that this is bringing societies closer together, even though physically we are becoming further away from each other at least. So this is an element to keep in mind. And I, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, education was mentioned yeah. initially and then maybe we could have more on that while we continue to, to talk about We will, we will, we will. Uh, but before we go into the economic side and specifically I want to talk about the United States, uh, and we have uh, both uh, Jeff and uh, Kerry here. Uh, I'd like, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, President Boris Tadic would like to share his views about what's happening in Europe and globally and what we can uh, derive from that. Boris? Thank you. Thank you, Ismail. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, one day when I became a president, uh, some people from the West came to my country uh, criticizing Serbia and the Balkan countries by saying uh, we never miss opportunity, an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But I, I'm afraid this is a characterizing whole world nowadays after Corona uh, virus and pandemic. Uh, every crisis is a chance to do something and to make kind of corrections. But I'm afraid that uh, the, the governments, especially of the global power, uh, governments are not behaving properly in, uh, in, in this time. And, and this is, a, from my point of view, really big challenge for the world. What uh, Western countries are doing, what China is doing, what Russia is doing. I mean, the Western countries are trying to blame China because, not, because of not proper reaction at the beginning of crisis in December last year. But at the same time, they are forgetting that uh, if uh, the Western healthcare system is dependent on the China proper reaction, uh, this is a confirmation that that healthcare system is very vulnerable. Uh, at the same time, uh, why they were so lazy in reacting on uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, problem in China because they had enough time to prepare themselves for proper reaction. And this is why I see that uh, everyone is uh, not uh, really ready to, to find us the uh, proper way for problems we are facing right now. Zlatko was uh, starting to talk about curves, uh, climate changing, economic crisis, and right now, problem with the viruses. Uh, last century, uh, we had a, that kind of very bad experience at the beginning of 20th century, that was a Spanish virus, uh, influence 1919, after that uh, 1960 pandemia, after that 2009 pandemia, and right now, 40, 40 years, every pandemic after each other, right now, 10 years after the last pandemia. Does it mean that we are going to live in a very frequent pandemias? Uh, is it uh, the fact that uh, it is showing us clearly that we have to prepare ourselves, our societies, our political systems, healthcare system to be uh, in a better condition to react uh, in, in the right time. And this is what I'm asking myself. But I don't see we have a such dialogue in the global community, in the, in the United Nations, and I'm afraid that we are going to lose a very important period of discussion. As a, as a very important time for very efficient discussion to find uh, solutions for problems we are facing with. Uh, some people are saying uh, that uh, new world orders that we expect to be implemented these years in this time uh, are going to be for sure implemented after coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid I'm afraid really that I'm not very optimistic in that respect, that uh, we'll lose momentum, 
once again, and that is going to bring us once again in a very problematic situation if we'll have uh, more frequently problems with the viruses. What is the good? I'm finishing with that, that this pandemia is uh, announcing, this pandemia is a, is, a, uh, is, a, is a kind of signal that we have to think more intelligent as a global community. We have to be more sophisticated and we are living in the very, very small world because viruses are not respecting borders. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boris, for, for that observation. But you also, one of the things that you said, and which I would like now to take to the United States and ask uh, both Kerry uh, Kennedy and, uh, and Jeff Sachs to comment on, uh, is uh, the ability of the Western uh, institutions, including the public health systems, including uh, the uh, decision-making structures, the scientific advisors, etc., to respond uh, rapidly with or without uh, Chinese uh, uh, input. Uh, some people are saying that, in fact, the problems in the United States are not uh, just what the president is or is not doing, but that the president has, in fact, exposed deep cracks and uh, deep problems and cleavages that already existed and that were allowed to, to grow over a period of time. Now, I have lived a very large part of my life, over 35 years, inside the United States. I am in the United States right now under, under lockdown in Washington. But uh, uh, fundamentally, I have never imagined that I would see uh, the, the kind of bread lines and, 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 and people uh, uh, lined up for food, uh, the people who lost their, their, their jobs and... Uh, uh, are uh, the the number of cars that are waiting just to get some food to bring home in the United States that seem to be almost impossible. Uh, secondly, a number of us are also a little bit concerned about the CDC, which is normally considered the top institution in the world for this kind of thing, is kind of missing in action. <laughs> what happened to the vaunted United States? Uh, incredible. Uh, quality of science uh, and uh, presumably scientific advice. Uh, and then uh, perhaps, uh, Kerry, you would like to start on this question of the, the enormous number of the jobless. I believe we have now uh, reached 14% of the unemployment rate. More than 30 million Americans have lost their jobs. But the, the uh, weaknesses of the social safety net, then we'll come back to Jeff and ask questions about the, the, the rescue package, the debt, and the monetary policy that could and should be followed before we come back to Zlatko. So Kerry, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, it's so great to see everybody. And thank you, Rob Sean, for organizing us as usual. Um, I am apologize for being late. I was actually on a conference call rather like this one about uh, child labor with Kailash Sancharki, who um, the NGIC is going to, is working with as well. So uh, we'll, we'll bring that back to you at a future date. Um, you know, you're talking about the divisions in the United States and it feels like they've never been greater. And in many ways they haven't ever been greater. Although I have to say that uh, that 50 years ago, we had riots in 125 cities across the country in one night, and we had um, we had uh, martial law in Dover, Delaware, for nine months. So um, I think that there we we're we're in a we're a country of divisions. We had a civil war. We we've had divisions all throughout our history, and this president has exploited those and made them a lot worse at a time of extraordinary crisis. Uh, as Jeff rightly calls it, an idiocracy. Um, I think there's, you know, there, democracy is certainly at risk in our country right at the moment. Um, the divisions re about this crisis form absolutely on along partisan lines. Um, elections have already been suspended by Democratic governors, and that's going to give a lot of co 
cover to Republican governors to do the same and to the President of the United States. And I think we're all fearful of that. Um, the yesterday the uh, the 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 uh, it was revealed that the Republican National Committee is putting twenty billion dollars with the B twenty billion dollars behind stopping voting rights um, lawsuits. So in order, <laughs> they're putting twenty billion dollars behind trying to assure that nobody can vote. So there is a clear, um, uh, uh, you know, political intention to stop democracy in the United States of America by the President of the United States. I don't know what else we need to say about democracy in our country beyond that, but it underlines everything that's going on. Um, and then, the, the, it has, has been said, the people who are uh, who are feeling the brunt of this, not only the isolation, but then, and they're the same people who, who are most hurt by the isolation, the same people most hurt by the COVID itself, and the people who are most, will be most hurt coming out of this in, in its aftermath. And those are the frontline healthcare workers, the journalists who are at high risk, uh, in doing their jobs and under attack every single day. The people in detention and in prisons who are the poorest people, they're in the most overcrowded places, they have no ability to social distance, they're most likely to infect the poor communities that they come from when they return to those communities. That's in the United States and of course around the world. People on the move, internally displaced refugees, the undocumented, and especially when those people end up in detention. That's a whole other swath of America and internationally. And then children. You know, the, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, if you are rich and white, you have a laptop and you can do at-home learning. If you are poor and a person of color, then the capacity to do at-home learning is extremely diminished. Uh, the panacea for child labor and child slavery is education, it's schools. Because if you're in school, you can't be in slavery. And um, the fact that schools have been suspended has made already those numbers just multiply and multiply. So. That's another issue. Um, children are also, uh, the, the number of porn sites, the demand for porn sites for child pornography doubled in the first three days of isolation. I mean, imagine what is going on now when, when kids are at home and families have no money. It's a disaster. And then, of course, women and children are at, the, the, the numbers on domestic violence have skyrocketed. Uh, the other groups are indigenous people, um, and Jeff uh, spoke so eloquently about this yesterday on another conference call, but maybe you could uh, give us the numbers on indigenous people in the US. Um, and I know that that's reflected across the globe. And then people in the supply chains, on the global supply chains that um, are, you know, basically in indentured servitude, no longer have jobs, do not have visas. Um, in the U.S., we have a uh, um, Tyson's Food, which is one of the largest meat packing companies in our country, um, said that they needed to be uh, lobbied the government um, so that they could be considered a, a necessary um, uh, a workforce, forced to go to work, whether they like it or not, in factories where 20 to 30 percent of the people have already co come down with corona, and then told, if you don't show up to for work, you will be deported. So this is the time, type of repression that we're facing right now, uh, a lot of it under the radar, and 
literally no news about the rest of the world. There is not one word of the rest of the world on CNN and any of the news posts. So it's it's hard to get that information. Uh, and unless you're really determined to. Okay, I'll stop there. No, indeed, indeed, it is uh, very hard to get all the information about all the countries. Uh, uh, but we talked about the fact that uh, there is an economic uh, catastrophe that has followed the the uh, public health catastrophe. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the United States, uh, the number of uh, people who lost their jobs in five weeks, uh, unheard of since the Great Depression, uh, unemployment reaching 14%. But that is in spite of already uh, almost three point something trillion dollars of uh, uh, issuing uh, government support. And thus I'd like to turn to, to, to Jeff and ask uh, two questions, uh, interrelated questions really. Uh, the, what should governments do, especially if you think in terms of the economic crisis that is now uh, in the United States, is it uh, going to last? How long will it last? And will there be a role for monetary policy, the central banks that played a role when, the, when the, there was a financial crisis back in 2008, 2009? Do they have a role today where the initiation of the, of the crisis tends to be a public health issue, not the financial uh, issue? And what about all the countries of the world that uh, cannot uh, borrow in their own currency like the United States does uh, what would be uh, uh, what should the role of the of the government and the central bank be, or will they be completely crushed by debts? So, uh, what comments would you have to say? Please unmute. Three easy questions as usual. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, let me start uh, uh, a little bit more on the U.S. situation. I, I'd like to explain or highlight one feature of this. Uh, Ismail, you asked, uh, where are the experts? Uh, what, what happened? There's a, uh, if you want to spend an hour to go into the deep uh, entrails of uh, all of this, there's a whistleblower in uh, Health and Human Services who made a 40-page uh, statement about what was really going on uh, inside the U.S. government in the first four months. And it's fascinating because uh, this is an expert, uh, and he understood from the first day that this was a massive risk. And for four months, he could not mobilize the political leadership of the United States to do something about the risk. And he explains in great detail what happened and what you see in this structure, it's almost like a novel, a novella. Uh, there's lots of expertise in the US, but the system is rotten. It is corrupt, deeply corrupt. And so the head of the health and human services is literally a health industry lobbyist. He came from one of the companies his interest is money. The president of the United States is corrupt, deeply corrupt. I don't think I have to elaborate uh, on this. All through the bureaucracy, uh, there were experts who were shut down for four months. And they were stopped because Jared Kushner, who is a creepy little kid, was pointing contracts to this one, to that one, we're in the hands of a little mob. It's important to understand that. He's a demagogue. He's a mobster. He has put industrial lobbyists all through the senior reaches. So there are talented people who are unable to do anything right now. And this gentleman finally came forward with a detailed account. It's fascinating to read. Now, it also comes to this question about Europe and China. I just want to say a word about this. Any expert knew in the first days of January that this was a pandemic and a crisis, highly contagious, very dangerous. 
by January 11, the virus was published online in its genome. By January 20th, WHO briefed everybody in the world, take care, this is extraordinary. By January 23rd, China was in lockdown. If we go to blame China, we will have a Great Depression. China is not the source of our problem in this, I'm sorry to say. And if we go to a, a war with China, we will divide the world in two, and that will be the making of a Great Depression because we will have no cooperation on anything. It's a false line made for politics. It is not a real line. And Europe, it's unintelligible, Anna, what happened in Europe. Where were the experts in Spain, Italy, France? This was obvious what was happening, but the public health community was nowhere. It's just not understandable, actually. But in the US, it was because of our corruption. This is very clear because we have experts everywhere, but they were shut down because of this creepiness from the top. We've been taken over, and that's what we're struggling against. But because of populism, because the mob translate this into a white-black divide, and this is uh, as America has been from the beginning, to get poor whites on the side of rich whites against the rest. This is our normal politics. We've had it for 250 years. And they play it, and it's playing again. And it's just as ugly as can be. And I have to say to Europe, please, the U.S. is not your geopolitical ally. I'm sorry. If Europe can't hang together and pursue Europe's... And of course, we, you've got... <laughs> we, we love each other. But that, the point is that right now, the U.S. is led by a mob. And if you just give it a pass, you're not doing Europe any favor at all. You're just getting swallowed by the mob. And so I don't mean the mob in the, I mean yeah, mobsters. I, I, what I mean is organized crime. I just wanted to be clear I, about understood, that. Understood, understood. Okay, but, but, okay. But, uh, but now let me go the, to the economics. Let me yeah. go to the economics. And then we'll come back to Anna and Max, but go ahead. Our, our, our unemployment rate is 25%. The headline unemployment rate is 14.7%, but the people who are without work that would like to work is a quarter of the population right now. The only way out of this, the only way out of this, and it's only a partial way out, is to stop the epidemic. Since we're not going to stop the epidemic in the United States for months or a year or two, we'll have more waves and so on, we're going to have high chronic unemployment no matter what Congress does or no matter what the Fed does because the economy is not going to function. It's also the case many of these jobs are never coming back. Jeff Bezos will run the retail sector of the United States in the future. Amazon will replace millions of jobs. Uh, E-commerce is absolutely not going to uh, be pushed back by shops. We're going to have miles and miles of empty storefronts at the end of this that will persist for years to come because the economy is going to move to a different kind of uh, economy in the future. So okay. we're in for something longer term. Now, just to come to your question, my best advice to everybody is have a central bank. When you have a central bank, you can print money. Uh, this is uh, the only survival mechanism right now. Governments don't have revenues, so you're going to have to print money. The Fed will print trillions and trillions of dollars. It will buy government bonds. It will uh, basically keep some part of the U.S. economy intact. The European Central Bank needs to do the same thing if the German uh, Supreme Court doesn't stop it from doing so. If it does stop it from doing so, God help the European Union, it will fall apart. Uh, for most of the world, there is no such central bank uh, available. And the only possible central bank for the rest of the world is the IMF. And that requires a different vision 
for the IMF, the one that Keynes had in 1944, not the one that Harry Dexter White of the United States had, which is an open liquidity coming from the IMF for the developing countries. It's feasible. It's the right strategy. The managing director of the IMF, who's wonderful, Kristalina Georgieva, understands and supports that vision. Uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, Christine Lagarde supports that vision. Probably most serious people in the world support that. The U.S. Treasury is dead set against it because if you have a central bank, you don't want others to have one too. Uh, and so uh, this is power as well as uh, as well as, well as uh, a matter of good economics, exactly. But the IMF should be an open liquidity, and we're going to have to cancel a lot of debts in the future. That's the right way to stop a Great Depression. But we're probably going to have a Great Depression globally, uh, the way we're going. Unnecessary, because Great Depressions are unnecessary. But we're heading in that direction because of the... Uh, anti-leadership of the United States, which is a rogue nation, and because we are not able to take the steps that we need to take, and because Europe is too weak to step in unless it gets its act together and says, we stand for decency and we work together. But to do that, Europe has to stop the pandemic inside first, because if it doesn't stop the pandemic, it's too weak to lead. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Anna, you wanted to, to intervene. Uh, unmute, unmute, please. Anna, unmute. Uh, yes. Telegraph. Hi, Jeff. I agree with you. Do, is the present United States an ally of the European Union? Not at all. I mean, absolutely not. On the contrary, if the United States would reach an, a more or less agreement with China, they would go against the, the European Union because of the White House. Now, this is true. It's true that the United States have been terrible. This, this, uh, this administration in the GCPOA, in the Paris Agreement, in a, all the things we have been standing for and we think are fundamental for this idea of, of uh, international system based on institution and, and agreements, I wouldn't say law, but at least agreements. And uh, the United States hasn't played. This idea of uh, America first has been terrible. By the way, for a, for a different uh, conversation, this did not start with, uh, with, uh, with this administration. It just it got an acceleration, but it started before. It started before the retreat of a United States that, if you allow my expression, unfortunately, the United States is going European. Uh, uh, in my, my American friends did not like because I entitled it this United States. When you have California, that California that says that I'm a nation state, when you have, and it's normal that, the, that these things happen, that, that you, you are beginning to see cracks in what has been the model for the federalism, the model for our, our European project. But uh, as I, I don't want to be melancholic and I hate, uh, I think that today a certain uh, half full glass is a responsibility. I would say that I bet on the ingenuity and the strength of the United States that we are discovering, that there are states, that, that there are governors, that there are individuals, that there are institutions, that there is the Supreme Court, and all this, I hope it will, it will change after January, because, uh, I mean, I hope that, that you fail yeah. and that President Trump will be elected. Now, one word on, on the European Union. Look. Uh, Jeff, you are absolutely right. Power today is linked to a central bank. Through this, through this crisis, and union, we seem, we seem to be union. Having, yeah. Yes, there's a problem with the internet. But yeah. We are now, unfortunately, so, trying to have the this 
perspective of the glass half full, we have to keep our fingers crossed for an election going to the Democrats and not to the, not the re-election with Trump. Because if there is a re-election uh, of Trump, then really the world is going to change. I Thank don't you. share and my I don't share your benign vision of China for a simple reason, which I, I understand is legal and not economic, and economy is driving the show. But you know, uh, the difference between the, the, for the first time, our Western system has a competitor that is based on a very different vision. We may be better or worse compliance with the idea of the Romans that we are free because slaves of the law. For the Chinese culture, law is purely instrumental. It's, uh, you know, uh, and, and we need to adapt our institutions, not to, be a, not to have them empty. And I have been general counsel of the World Bank Group. I know what I'm speaking about. We are getting, we are getting principles that have nothing to do with this structure. For instance, harmony. The, the, the individual which is at the center, the citizen, it's our, at the center of our system, of our multilateral system, our liberal democratic system is the citizen, the individual. For the Chinese system is the collectivity, is the China, the eternal China. So you take the Uyghurs, one million, two million, three million, you throw, throw them in jail and nothing happens because they are not the subject. So, okay. We cannot obviate China. We have to play with China. We have to reach agreements with China. But unless we come back to basics and we know what we stand for and we really present a clear, a, a clear countering of China, what we have is China is building their own system, and then China is, is taking the, the existing institutional multilateral system as spoiling. So I'm happy to go, but the WHO has been a victim of this spoil system plus asking too much for an institution that doesn't yeah. have the but nor the competencies. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, I, I really want to go back. We are getting close to uh, to towards the, not quite close yet, but to close towards the, the end of our uh, session. But Mats, uh, you are in, uh, you know, in a strange situation where you have a test that nobody else has had. Uh, my understanding is that Sweden refused to close down, uh, simply appealing to citizens to do social distancing. It has had somewhat higher deaths uh, than say Norway and Denmark. But uh, it's a unique experiment in the world where the economy was allowed more or less to function unhindered. So could you just tell us uh, uh, your view as to uh, that unique experiment? Uh, because uh, as far as I can make out, it is unique, uh, a purposeful decision of a democratic government not to enforce uh, uh, policies uh, of lockdown and uh, and uh, that has uh, had this economy functioning. Could you but don't forget to to uh, unmute. Well, thank you for the question, Ismail. I have uh, reserved my opinion on uh, the Swedish uh, method, if you will, uh, before there is more fact uh, to uh, to base it on. I think what is quite interesting is that uh, the model was based on, on focusing on the vulnerable and uh, allowing the, as much as possible of the economy uh, to function. Now, the vulnerable have indeed been protected in the sense that uh, the, the health system is not at all overloaded. So in that sense, it's close to what Jeff was suggesting in the beginning, but I think uh, of what the appropriate way of handling this is. But uh, 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 the Swedish system probably overestimated how strong it would be to, um, to uh, protect cer certain vulnerable groups 
like people in elderly homes or immigrants in vulnerable parts of the suburbs. And so therefore the death rate is higher than we expected. But uh, the interesting part I think is that the choices have enormous support within the society. And if this now levels out and uh, um, doesn't go much higher, then we are better positioned to weather the economic challenges and come back because people are still employed, people are working, they haven't been gotten their livelihoods uh, ruined. So there is something interesting in there, but uh, yet again, I wouldn't, wouldn't um, uh, exaggerate the difference in behavior uh, by a, a lot of people. Let's, let's see what happens. I think that the point about having a response that has great support is very interesting. And Ismail, if I may throw in this, I, I think that, you know, at the tone of our discussion here has really focused on the challenges, the ur urgency, how the world is disintegrating and we're getting disorder and not a new world order. And for that, to get, we here could get our collective thoughts around a to-do list that is clear and concrete on financial reform, on climate change, on inequality, many things. But what is keeping political decision makers from focusing is sometimes I think that the options are not fleshed out clearly enough. And for people here who have been involved in very serious international decision making and national decision making, I think we, people like us, could help, perhaps like in a new international commission of some sort, to, to spell out the options on the basis of very good analysis. And that would then help politics choose better, because it's the choosing between hard choices that is a difficult thing, not presenting what ought to be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, uh, dear friends, we are getting towards the, the ending segment, and I'm going to go around and give everybody a chance, and I would like particularly President Vaira to help us in, in, uh, in trying to wrap up and, and uh, get some uh, thoughts out of this. So we just heard from uh, Mats and Anna. Uh, let's go to uh, Boris. Uh, would you like to share some uh, short, pithy, one to two minute concluding statement on your part? Are you, are you addressing? Uh, uh, unmute, me? please unmute. Uh, Boris, please unmute. Then we'll go to Zlatko, Jeff, Kerry, and Eka, and then come back to President Vaira to help pull together the, the, the threads of this discussion. So, Boris, please go ahead. Okay, this is a, uh, this is a really, I, I, I consider current situation as a chance. Uh, I consider current situation as a chance because every crisis is a real chance. Uh, the problem is uh, that we have a populist and demagogues on the power in a very important countries. Not only in the United States, but all over the Europe and uh, other regions in the world. Uh, in that respect, I think intellectuals, uh, responsible politicians, uh, uh, those people that uh, uh, has to create a kind of atmosphere for dialogue of what to do with the challenge we are facing. Uh, coronavirus is uh, really very dangerous, uh, but we can expect even more dangerous viruses in the future. Uh, what if we are going to have a combination between virus and, uh, and, and economic uh, crisis? And everyone uh, who have said that uh, we can expect uh, economic crisis, which is going to be deeper and uh, more dangerous than the previous one, uh, is, a, is a having right. And uh, I, I have a concerns about next few years. Really, uh, this is time for reaction, and uh, we have to work on creating new global orders. Thank you. Zlatko? Unmute. I should be faster. Okay, I unmuted myself. Thank you, Smile. Uh, great. I, uh, I mean, I'm sure that everyone is getting out richer of this conversation because we share a lot of interesting thoughts. I saw a lot of things that just provoke me to think even more. I think it would be good that just to catch up what Mats was uh, just in his final remarks saying and connecting to what we heard previously. It wouldn't be a bad idea, Ismail, that we try to formulate some kind of uh, non-paper 
uh, as Matt's called it, the International Commission. And we can form our NGIC commission, so to put it this way, to tackle three new normal issues. Things area. It's about the economy, it's about environment or climate change, because there is more than a self-evident connection between epidemic and environmental issues. So we should talk about economy, environment, and social issues, especially dealing with the things with human rights. So we don't get, uh, because of pandemic, we don't hijack justice, human rights, uh, and things like that. So I think it would be a good idea, especially because uh, Jeff had an excellent article that he just made yesterday about Argentina and how to avoid global finance yeah. catastrophe, which is clear signal how it's connected that one country, one tiny country in a global context, can simply make the domino effect that everything starts falling apart. So maybe we should, and we have you, Smile, we have Mats, we have uh, Jeff, I mean, people who are either being close to World Bank and we have heads of the states and governments who are dealing with very clear economic issues and problems, to, so to speak. We have, uh, we have Kerry and RFK is a human rights beacon uh, institute. I mean, we should maybe think about putting the thing, some kind of what international financial institutions should do at this moment in order to protect the countries, vulnerable countries, to, to, to give them some kind of model. Thank you. So maybe my, 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 my suggestion to you, Smile and to Vaira, you as a co-chairs of our co-chairs, that we should try to produce some kind of non-paper paper, if we can put it that way. Corona things, I mean, and call to financial institutions, to, to G20 tomorrow, because the letter that we produced, uh, that we follow up, Gordon Brown, was a really good one. The one, Smile, that you were talking about, food problems, was a really good one. Uh, I think uh, we see right now that terrorism, you asked me to prepare, I did my homework, I won't talk about it, but terrorism is now sleeping because they figured out, I mean, that they cannot kill so many people like, like Corona can do it. So people are not interested in terrorists because they want, to have a, they want to have attention. And sooner or later, they will try to get attention uh, because, of, because of injustice, because of uh, pandemic results in the conspiracy theories, xenophobia, uh, and things like that that will be on horizon. So to make long story short, thank you very much to everyone. I learned a lot. And I hope that we will produce something which more than us will read and to push some people who are sitting in positions that we used to be sitting in. Thank you, Zlatko. Jeff? I think it's a great idea to produce something, uh, and uh, I would uh, love to join in on that. And I think that there is a lot to say, and uh, it's a very, very dangerous time for all of the reasons we've been talking about, and good thinking could uh, get us out of this without uh, disaster, even, even could get us out in a constructive direction. Um, I, I wanted to uh, continue with Anna because uh, I, I agree so much with you in, except for one thing, uh, which is that uh, China is like China really for 2000 years. And we want to live together peacefully with China that has a different philosophy, a different history, uh, a different ethos. It is not the ethos uh, of Europe, but it is an ethos uh, with many splendid things, in my opinion. Uh, it's not all a negative ethos. It's not the Communist Party of China trying to take over the world and so forth, as we hear every day in the United States. It's a different ethos. It's a Confucian ethos, uh, not a Greco-Roman Christian ethos. Okay, but we can cooperate. Uh, and. Uh, we actually all signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, China too. Uh, and this is important as well. That is a moral charter that's a global charter still for the world. And I think that that's a basis for cooperation as well. So my dream for the world is a strong Europe with the European values, which for me are at the core of my values. So I, I like that idea, but it's a cooperative world. Uh, where serious agreements between mature regions uh, are seriously working on things rather than playing political games like the U.S. does in trying to contain, to build hostility, to make a new Cold War, to play uh, games for, because it's, you know, I, I won't take us too far away, but the U.S. idea is primacy or hegemony. 
Uh, that's no model for the world. Uh, the model for the world is cooperation. And we all share that idea. And so that's why I'm uninterested in the U.S. being the leader or uh, the primate country and why I see a world of regions cooperating with each other. But I don't think it's our job to say we can't cooperate with China because they're more communitarian, more Confucian, uh, rather than uh, you know, uh, values uh, that are more European. Fine. I happen to love a lot of Chinese values. I love a lot of European values. I'd uh, rather live in Europe, uh, as, okay. uh, as the case is. But, but the point is, we should maturely talk about peaceful cooperation and respect in a diverse world, even a diversity of ethics, but within a broader scheme of uh, common humanity. And I think that that is absolutely possible. But we need it now also uh, not to fall into recrimination and division. If we do, we'll solve none of the practical problems in the next three, four, or five years. We will break the multilateral system. And all I'm saying is that is the intention of a significant part of the US power structure. The intention, not the exception, not the accident, the intention. This will be a disaster for the world if we do this. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Kerry? Um, thank you. And uh, again, thank you to everybody for your comments. And uh, uh, Jeff, you know, you, you always um, tell us everything that's wrong, but you never fail to also give us a sense of hope for what could be. So. I really, really appreciate that. I think he, I, I think there's a little bit of good news here, and the good news is that um, that people are talking about inequality in a way that they really have never talked about it before. So it's, it's on people's lips. Things people are thinking about it. Um, I think there's a renewed appreciation for for family, for access to community um for an appreciation for the earth that people want to be able to go outside they're realizing i need trees i need the land i need to be connected to that and there's also a palpable resurgence of spirituality um maybe called faith or institutions but it's it's basically spirituality it's being connected with one another and a call to unity and um and an increased understanding of the importance specifically of public health, um, which I think we can use those to advance this agenda of, of justice and peace and appreciation for human rights and, and basic human dignity, which is at the core of what everything NGIC stands for. Thank you. Uh, Eka? You unmute. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, briefly, uh, two two issues that I wanted to refer to when it comes to the countries that are developing countries, because when I'm listening to the economic uh, elements that are that need to be taken into account for the recovery, uh, one needs to bear in mind once again that countries who are poor and still developing, they central banks have very little foreign currency reserves. They are in debt to the private debtors and then to, to the international advice as well. They are still grasping perhaps to understand the initial scale of understanding of what comes for them to, to deal with. And um, without very, very close cooperation and understanding of what could be the best mechanisms to alleviate some burden of the debt, not only with IFIs, but with private debtors as well, which are very difficult to think of right now, perhaps because, for example, IMF's money cannot be used for the private debtors, right? So uh, these are the issues that these countries are dealing with uh, already now in terms of starting to think yes. about it. That could lead to devastating effects if there are no solutions to that. I've been thinking about an element uh, related to the migration and freedom of movement. And in the countries like Ukraine, for example, remittances is a huge element of the local economy. And these will be now limited 
to the maximum because many Ukrainians who work abroad, they are back. So how the policies that will emerge out of this crisis related to migration, war permits, and all of those elements, which are big components of many countries in terms of remittances and even their contribution to the local GDPs are up in the air. So if the national policies will be developing in the way that borders will be closed much more, then it will be an element that will have uh, perhaps even detrimental effect to some economies. And then Anna mentioned it that uh, what is happening now is an accelerator of so many things that were already happening. I cannot agree more to what she mentioned in this regard. And uh, to add to that, for example, from the point of view of artificial intelligence and robotics, I would imagine that many countries, especially to the north and in developed economies, will try to accelerate the process of relying maybe uh, on, on robotics and artificial intelligence versus to the supply lines that they've seen could be disrupted related with China, for example. So in this regard, how much that will affect the poor countries to the south as well. We haven't talked about Africa that much, but sub-Saharan Africa, for example, African countries, and the way how they've been part of the supply and demand chains yeah. globally yeah. in economy, huge problem. And finally, uh, education, I would really urge us when we will be continuing with the follow-up excellent uh, steps that have been proposed with the paper and then with the commission to look into this issue of education because Kerry has mentioned an excellent point when it comes to the slavery, which is an utmost challenge, so to say, obviously, when it comes to the even physical security per se of children. But if we would look more into the future, what is the potential of being a workforce for kids who are now in the educational systems and if the education is disrupted for them even more than it was previously in the countries where, unlike to my kids, which have both of them individual uh, laptops and then good Wi-Fi at home and can have a good access to the good school where online teaching is uninterrupted for them now and I can't complain on anything, most of the children around the world don't have any access yes. to education because they don't have it. What will happen with them in few years time because their inter they education was interrupted completely perhaps in an era where it will be high-tech jobs more rather than manual jobs in so many ways we need to think about this now so while we are preoccupied with the imme imminent threat of containment so to say of the effects of pandemic healthcare related issues it's already time to think about that as well otherwise there will be no new normal that would be an attractive new normal that could emerge rather than new normal that will be worse than it was previously perhaps thank you Thank you very much, Eka. Yes, I understand. Anna, you want to say something? Go ahead. My, I have to because back don't put in my mouth. I, uh, to be very short, cooperation is the name of the game. Hegemony is not any longer here. Not the United States, not the Western world. Cooperation is here. And we need to adapt, but we need to adapt eyes wide open and jeff it's not me i was not among the consensus of the economists that said that by bringing china to the wto there will be a pluralistic uh, opening no we have to understand that china is the same china that 2000 years ago that it's it's a very different concept from ours and it's not i mean we have to know where we are and cooperate yes but not just be drawn into this so i great respect great uh, i think mean, great interest about what china is doing but at the same time uh we have to keep our eyes wide open now for our organization i think this is a great topic to bring a certain common sense because china is a china the the west the china multilateralism this brings demons all over the place. And uh, Jeff, and uh, although I'm a great admirer of his, he just puts things that I have never said and that on the contrary, I have written on all this. So why not? Why not specialize in this idea that we have to come, we have to cooperate with China, that this is, this is the future. We need to speak about good and carrying this knows extremely well on how to cooperate with china in africa and this could be our mo our characteristic we could specialize thank you i think that in the world of today we have to find niches thank you thank you very much thank you let me now turn to president vaira 
President Vaira, you've uh, may we have the, the the benefit of your wisdom. Please unmute yourself. Uh, unmute your. Uh, President Vaira is unmuted. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. Or am I unmuted? I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you, Ismail, first of all, for chairing uh, this meeting. It's been absolutely fascinating. And our deepest thanks to, to Rafshan and the office for keeping uh, work uh, at an intensive level, more than intense, uh, under circumstances which we won't bore uh, the, the rest of you uh, under very difficult uh, internal circumstances. Uh, thank you for all of you for your insights and, and for the time you've given us. And, and even more so, thank you for your commitment uh, to us somehow putting our heads together and, and coming up with some sort of declaration. Everybody and his dog and his cat are busy making declarations at, at, uh, at this moment. Uh, at the same time, the situation is so complex uh, and uh, so changeable from day to day uh, that we simply cannot do without these declarations. We need them to keep informed and to keep up to date. Uh, just between what we have heard uh, this afternoon, this afternoon here, um, the, uh, the list of ills that this pandemic has either created or, or highlighted uh, the fractions within societies and internationally that have existed before and that have been exacerbated are endless. I could give concrete examples, we do not have a time for that. And, and the, the difficulty for us in framing uh, an intervention that would be helpful among the numerous, numerous um, sort of declarations that people are making would be to find a balance between having a clear-sighted view of the scope, the enormity of the difficulties that face us, um, having a clear-sighted acknowledgement of the failures, uh, for instance, uh, the United Nations, what has the United Nations been doing uh, that has been of, of tremendous help uh, in this pandemic? What has the Security Council been able to do? It hasn't even been able to make a declaration on COVID. But why not? Because inherently it's, it's an obsolete uh, organization that simply will not, uh, as long as it keeps the five permanent uh, Security Council members as they are since, since its creation, uh, in this particular situation, obviously, we can't expect a thing from it. Guterres is a, is a wonderful man, but uh, he has the Security Council to, to deal with. The World Health Organization is dependent on voluntary contributions. Uh, um, uh, the, the total sums at its uh, disposal are, in fact, uh, ridiculously low for the, for the size of the task that uh, internationally uh, it, it should be able to undertake. And, and of course, uh, the American president's uh, uh, decision to blame them for all the ills and, and to withdraw is definitely not the moment to do that. Although that organization, I mean, Mr. Trump has certain, uh, certain points where he's right, that uh, body uh, has not really been functioning <laughs> ideally in the way we would like to see it function. I think that we have to really reflect deeply about recognizing what is wrong. And there's plenty, plenty. Uh, summarizing it in, a, in as concise a way as we can, and then uh, come up with concrete suggestions, albeit ones uh, that are restricted. And I personally would feel that the Pandemic is not, not over by any means. Uh, I hear from experts uh, that we will have to live with COVID-19 for the rest of our lives. Uh, that our societies will have to be restructured uh, with an understanding. We will be forever keeping two meter distances from each other, according to some, uh, some health experts. Not to mention the possible mutations uh, our, our scientists uh, in small Latvia have already determined 12 local Latvian uh, mutants uh, of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Imagine what, uh, how many mutants it has uh, worldwide and that, that we will have to live with uh, in future years, not to mention others. Um, at the same time, uh, there's enough knowledge about focused, uh, effective, pragmatic interventions that can save lives, that can save people from despair, 
uh, UNESCO, I'm on this group uh, at UNESCO, where we're looking at the future of education, what can be done uh, about all those children who cannot benefit uh, from distance learning. Uh, and indeed, even the ones uh, who have access to distance learning, what will this future uh, look like for them as well? Um, it's not an easy job. All of you are involved in, in numerous other uh, activities, but I think Ismail and I and Roshan, we would be deeply grateful if you would commit uh, and uh, some of your time uh, and your thought and your wisdom to something that we as, as Nizami, because of, of the place that it has acquired internationally, it is an additional voice among the chorus of voices internationally. And I do think that there is room for our voice to be heard in that chorus and to come with its own message uh, uh, and its own, uh, be it even a relatively brief declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Vaira. Uh, thank you, each and every one. Uh, I would like just to say that uh, this is not the last chance we'll have to get together. Uh, and we will have to organize uh, the next time uh, a little bit uh, more precisely uh, and uh, perhaps uh, to ensure that we can get the maximum uh, amount of input from, uh, from everybody. Uh, uh, the Nizami Ganjavi International Center is very much aware that we are passing through a truly historical event. A uh, historical event where, in fact, uh, the rise of the East is being noted, where uh, cleavages and problems that existed in societies are being uh, uh, exposed. Uh, and perhaps the last time we had uh, a major transitional event of this kind was the Second World War. But as somebody rightly observed, in the Second World War, all the humans were fighting each other. This time, we are all fighting a virus. This should be the seeds of possibilities of collaboration, multilateralism, a new architecture that may perhaps recognize the differences, as Jeff said, between uh, the Chinese ethos and the Western ethos, and the views of other countries, which we haven't even discussed, from Latin America to, to Africa to South Asia, and uh, so on. And the, the NGIC uh, uh, really looks to its membership uh, to help us uh, craft that. So as President Vaira said, our voice can be heard among the chorus of voices, but hopefully that it will be able to distill and bring together the collective wisdom of this membership. I thank you each and everyone for having participated in this event. And uh, Jeff, uh, goodbye. <laughs> See you next time, all of you. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you each and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.